This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. So, welcome folks. We're really pleased to have you here at Core Brain Journal. We are, you're going to have a great time listening to our guest today, Dr. Joni Lou, and she is out in Calgary, Canada, in in Alberta, right out there on the Bow River in beautiful Canada. And uh, I've had the privilege of talking to her just for a couple moments here on the warm up, but we we also talked previously on another occasion, and she is going to bring a lot of really interesting material for us. She's a person who uh, does uh, a whole lot of different things that uh, at first may seem controversial, but when you hear her talk about it you're going to really be uh, amazed. So what I'm gonna do is do a brief bio here and tell you about her. She's a physician, an author, a speaker, and a brain expert. Uh, Dr. Johnny, as she calls herself, is an international leader in Chinese sports medicine and Chinese sports psychology. She has appeared on Fox, NBC, CTV, and Global TV, to speak up proactively about concussions. She's written three books about healing concussions, and later on we're gonna tell you how you can actually sign up for a drawing for one of her uh, exemplary books, and that'll be lower, uh, later on in the, uh, in the broadcast here. So, uh, welcome, jo- uh, Dr. Joni. Uh, please fill us in a little bit on a personal note, what you do, who you are, uh, add a little bit uh, more dimension to, to who you are as a person, please. Well, first of all, Dr. Parker, I really want to thank you for having me on the show because I so want to help you to also get uh, predictable outcomes from um, concise, comprehensive solutions. I totally agree with your philosophy about that. So, um, on a personal level, I used to be a practicing engineer, that's what I did for 24 years, and while I was a practicing engineer, I actually had a cancer scare, and it was that cancer scare that turned everything around for me, turned my world totally upside down, because I thought that my body had betrayed me, and I thought that I was doing everything that I'm supposed to do because they tell you then, as they do now, that all you need is a great diet and to exercise on a regular basis. And then I found out, oh my God, that's not, <laughs> that's not everything. And it wasn't until several years later when I left corporate life and started studying Chinese medicine when I discovered that, well, when you're angry, that it affects you more than anybody else around you and that's when I found out the importance of our emotional and psychological state is going to have a lot more impact on you than you think and so that opened my eyes to the way I do things today the way I practice so that's very interesting let's run the tape back a little bit and ask you this question so what kind of an engineer were you (laughs) <laughs> that was a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> Were you chemical? Was it electrical? What did you do? I was a civil engineer. I worked in the oil patch, and uh, I guess in the last 17 years of that career, I was actually a person in um, information technology. So I, I did things like programming all the way up to uh, being a business analyst and being a liaison between business and um uh, IT. So it was it was fun but very stressful and I was a very angry person. <laughs> I can't imagine you being angry after, after talking with you just a little bit. You just you have such a wonderful engaging personality. It just this doesn't make any sense. But so then the what was the type of cancer? What to get a little more personal, what happened with with that? Yeah, it was actually a, a bad pap test. Uh-huh. Result and it it shocked me. It um, my doctor called me in and broke the bad news to me, and so it meant um, I needed to have some exploratory s- surgery. and And I drove home and 
and on the way home I just cried all the way home oh. and didn't tell anybody except my husband and I, I was I just felt so isolated I, and believe it or not I felt embarrassed because my perfect life suddenly just turned topsy-turvy on mm, me and mm. I wasn't perfect anymore. Wow. So yeah. then it turned out okay in some respect what what actually happened. I mean you're here with us what what happened then? Yeah, it was it was uh, I didn't realize this until I was studying. But but the thing is is that while I was doing research on cervical cancer, um I came across a nurse who told me um, about the demographic because we're talking about the 1990s here she told me that the demographic who usually got cervical cancer were people who had multiple partners who also had multiple partners in mm. other words prostitutes uh -huh. and of course and of course I went that's not me <laughs> you know because yeah. I'm a professional yeah I'm an engineer, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I've, you know, I've only had one partner, uh, I'm a community leader, no way, and mm -hmm. I think that's what turned it around for me, because realizing that, yeah, it wasn't me. So weeks later, everything came back clean, and, uh, and but the thing is, is that while I was going through that, I really looked at my life really, really closely realized that I'd been a doormat for a very long time, that I had been behaving like a good little girl but not being very happy about it. And that's why I was so angry because I felt so, because I was such a victim. Oh, and, and I decided no more victim. And I started standing up to myself as well as to my boss my family, my husband, <laughs> I stopped being a doormat and started taking charge of my life. Yeah. And they were all in shock. We've seen oh, that happen yeah. a few times. Yes, it's true. It's and then, true. And then how did you actually do that additional twist of getting in this very unconventional, I mean, it isn't unconventional in Calgary perhaps, but in a lot of the parts of the world, uh, Chinese medicine is quite unconventional. How did you make that uh, significant change? Well, um, I left my corporate job. You know, I, I didn't want to do the full-time thing anymore. I wanted to go out and contract. So I became a contractor, being more in control of my career, and uh, did really well during Y2K, if you remember that. And then the contract started drying up, and so I, I had this time on my hands, so I started looking for, for more meaningful work, something that would really mirror my values. And so in typical fashion, I did more, more research, so I looked at becoming a natural nutritionist, I looked at becoming um, a Western herbalist and then finally traditional Chinese medicine. And I guess with natural nutrition, I found, well, when I audited their courses, I found, well, I, c I can teach these courses. <laughs> so they wouldn't be able to teach me anything new. And, and with natural, uh, with the um, herbology stuff, um, I discovered I had to have a green thumb and have my own garden, and that really didn't suit me very well either and when I was talking to uh, people in different schools for traditional Chinese medicine that's when I discovered that I could do anything that I wanted in this practice and that's what I did that's why I headed there so then how the that's an interesting so you were searching around in, in, a, in kind of a global way thinking about a variety of things that would be more naturalistic given the problem that you had with your medical condition and, and non-medical condition. And so then how did you get into brain science and concussions, which really is one of the, it's such an important area to be in. It's one of the reasons we really are pleased to have you on because there's so much confusion and so many, I think, opportunities when one begins to uh, pop open the hood and look at what's actually going on with uh, concussive injury, brain injury, and and healing. How did you make that particular turn? Well, you know, you're darn right. There is a lot of confusion out there. And um, 
I guess I, I had already um, realized that I had a healing process um, that was used to help people for all kinds of different reasons and the fact is is that I started to approach things from a psychological wellness um, point of view first instead of just dealing with the physical because because in, in from my experience and from watching other people it was if we only deal with the physical symptoms it, it's really quite temporary it's not it's not permanent enough it's mm -hmm. not predictable enough as yeah. as you like to say mm -hmm. and so I guess uh, January 1st 2011 um, there was a game between Pittsburgh and Washington uh, it was an NHL game and Sidney Crosby who was a major star for Pittsburgh Penguins got a concussion that day and usually you know it, it's no big deal you hear about this pretty frequently yes. in professional sports right yes however when, as I was following his story I soon realized that they weren't getting it he wasn't getting any better it took him almost two full years to get back into the NHL Mm. And all along that time, they were struggling with diagnosis and rediagnosis. They he wasn't getting better, and so I realized at the time, geez, you know, I wish I could talk to this guy, you know, show him my process. And then all of a sudden, um, in the summer of 2012, I got a call from my own son who told me that, Mom, I've got a concussion, I was hit so hard in the head I, I actually went blind. And that was the last thing that I expected was to be treating my own son for a concussion. So, so he asked me for help. He had tried to deal with this on his own for two weeks because, you know, he's a grown man, he's got his own house and, you know, he's got a great job. And so he's used to taking care of himself. So when he asked me to help, it was more than two weeks. He was not sleeping, he wasn't eating, he had no appetite, and he was still working at his full-time job um, as a professional engineer. So he was a wreck, and he knew that if he didn't do anything soon and fast, that it was definitely going to affect his job because not being able to sleep and not eating is going to get you very far. Mm. So he had to do something. And so I said, yes, but you got to do everything that I tell you to do because unlike, unlike the usual protocol for concussions, there is, in fact, something that you can do. And there is a set of steps that you can do for that predictable outcome that you are looking for. <laughs> and so, um, so I met with my son for two hours or more for his intake. And uh, then we proceeded to work with each other on a regular basis. But one of the things that I found out um, because we already had a little bit of an inkling that earlier that summer that he wasn't that happy at work but then in the intake it really came out very loud and clear about the trouble that he was in and it was because um, he was having problems with a supervisor it took um, his old one had left the company it took the company six months to find this guy and by I guess by that point they were kind of desperate so <laughs> but the thing is is that the very first meeting with this new supervisor the guy said to his young team of engineers I want to be your friend and so well they were looking for a leader they weren't looking for a friend they were looking for somebody who would you know clear the field go you know come to go they'd go to him for uh, with their problems and he would help them with solutions and whatnot, right? That's what you want in a supervisor. And so his best friend at work, my son's best friend at work, decided right away that he was quitting. <laughs> so mm. he found a job and he was preparing to quit. In the meantime, my son wanted to, he wanted to stay because he loves being there, but he didn't want to work for this guy. So he was very stressed out because he didn't know what to do so he was very indecisive 
And then the concussion happened because it hit him right on the side of the head where um, the gallbladder meridian in this particular case governs the head, runs through the head, and gallbladder actually governs decision making and being decisive. So that was a number one big clue for me because Chinese medicine is very intuitive. And so that contributed to part of the diagnosis, not all of it, but all the other things that he told me and the rest of the intake definitely brought me to that conclusion. And as we were working together, then I decided that, well, you're the one with the problem and your boss has no idea that you're the one that you're going through this. He doesn't have the problem. Since you're the one with the problem, then you have to make the first step. You were going to get him on it and get it going. Yeah, he has to get it going. I mean, he already made a decision that he was going to get well. And I knew that I didn't know at first, you know, what I was going to be asking him to do or directing him to do. But the thing is, is that it's going to usually take you outside of your comfort level and comfort zone. And for him, he's a quiet guy. A lot of engineers are very quiet. They just want to get their job done. <laughs> they just want to work, right? He wanted to do something that he knew instead of something that he didn't know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you were coming in with something that he didn't know, and, and you kind of did a mental flip-flop for me, too, when you talked about the gallbladder meridian. I mean, speaking as a, as a guy who's done a lot of brain imaging, uh, you know, I have no idea where that is or what it is, but that, that was an interesting leap right for, for me right there. I don't know where he was with it, but being an engineer, I imagine he had a, a considerable amount of perplexity as well. Well, as you know, I, like I explained to you, um, the thing is, is that he was hit just above the ear mm -hmm. on the right side. And on the side of the head, that is where the gallbladder meridian runs. So it runs from near the eye, over the head, around the ears, and all the way down um, the shoulders, the back, actually where near the sciatic nerve, as well as down to your little toe. So, you know, like if he was weaker in other places, it could have hit him, it could have hurt him, he could have had a leg injury, but in this case, it was his brain that was weakened by all the stress, mm. okay? Mm. So, um, stress is always going to weaken some part of the body. Everyone is constitutionally born with a weakness in certain places in their body. In my son's case, it happened to be at that part of his brain. So, so what I asked him to do was to set up regular meetings with his boss and talk to him and ask him for what he wanted. And, of course, he looked at me. <laughs> and then I said, okay, you're not going to make the same mistakes that your mother made when she was in corporate. We're going to break the cycle right now because I just kept everything repressed, okay, and suppressed my anger and look what almost happened to me. And the thing is, is that I told him, okay, so you can, you can have these meetings, but there's no guarantee that he's going to listen to you, that he's going to do anything for you, there are no guarantees because, of course, you have no control over that person, but you do have control over yourself. And that was a very tough lesson. But he agreed to do it because so, he had made a promise. So did he yeah. then did he then follow your regimen at that point and and began to really take more self responsibility in his own care? Oh yes. Definitely. I mean, isn't Definitely. that isn't that always the case when you think about it? I mean, when we do the kind of things we do, whether we're doing straight psychiatry, uh, psychology, whether we're doing anything in functional medicine, uh, really the psychology of a person taking self-responsibility is so much, so often the impediment to actually moving forward. There, there's an overall feeling of passivity. If I can just I'm going to present myself to you and you do the work mm -hmm. and I'll be mad as the dickens at you if you don't get it done for me but I I'm not going to work myself. I'm going to I'm going to approach this thing as I've got a problem and you've got to fix it. 
It's you're totally right on because it's in order to heal, you've got to take responsibility for the healing because we the doctors we can only guide you. We can't make you heal. All that work has to be done on the inside. So my son got brave enough, but the thing is is that he got better so much faster because of it because he was suddenly in control because he suddenly knew that he could actually do something about it I mean the only reason why we ever get stressed out is because we feel helpless for a very temporary time I mean and it, and it should be temporary but as soon as we actually see a way to take control of a situation and we're willing to do it then we start healing then we start getting better that's the bottom line. Fantastic. Let me ask you another couple of quick questions. So I know that your son got better because you just told me he did by <laughs> telling me the fact that he made process in taking care of himself, progress, pardon me, in taking care of himself. Yeah. Now, could you give us another quick example of what you do where you've seen it and make it a little more brief because we really want to hear kind of the punchline on the story. It's very interesting as we take it down, but here's the problem. Give us a quick solution of, of some people that you've seen so we can become a little more uh, tuned in with what you're talking about. Well, okay, a lady came to me. Um, she, had a neuro, she had a neurological problem. Um, she, the doctors told her that she had, um, oh, God, now I can't think of it. The scientific <laughs> name. The scientific, scientific name. name. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. What did she show clinically? What was she... How did she appear to you when she came in? Well, she, she her jaw really hurt, okay? So um, she could barely talk. She could barely open her mouth. And so, okay. Was it I, trigeminal neuralgia? Yes, yes, okay. yes. For some reason, it just slipped I know, it's funny. <laughs> you get These things go out of your head all the time when you start looking at it in a different way. I mean, the, everybody's beyond the labels, if you think about it. The labels... Yeah describe it but they don't do anything with it so go ahead I'm sorry I interrupted exactly exactly so I mean she's a teacher and so she, having to talk was a direct requirement right and she certainly wasn't ready to retire and so for her um, it was all the pain was on the left side and it was getting worse on the right and for in her particular case in the intake, she had told me that her husband had gone away. And I thought that was her way of saying that he had died and that she was a widow, uh, a widow and she had um, brought up her three daughters all by herself and she had done a fantastic job. But as we got to know each other, I suddenly realized that her husband was still alive. Mm. And the fact that he had an accident and they, it drove them, them apart, and so he wasn't a functional husband anymore, so they divorced. But, but the feelings of anger, of abandonment, yeah. of regret, yeah. they were all lodged around her jaw. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, because I'm going to give you another zinger, the large intestine <laughs> <laughs> meridian runs in the face. And that is affected by sadness, by grief, by worry. So she was alone. Mm. And it built up in the very place where she needed to make a living. Okay? Mm. And so it was all pent up there. And so with our work together, it was about releasing all that pain, all that trauma of the divorce, you know, everything. And it made a huge difference in her life. Well, you've got, I'm interrupting you for a second because you have, you have everybody listening here very curious. I'm going to tell you that right now. Because <laughs> what you're saying is you've mentioned a couple of times our work. And yeah. we, we really have a limited amount of time here. But I want you to take a moment, if you will, because we're, we're now enthusiastically listening to just what do you do? What is the work? I mean, uh, I take it that you're not a osteopathic physician or a chiropractor so you're not doing manipulation no so then I don't know whether you're giving the person specific herbal products to directly affect the gallbladder meridian or the uh, large intestine meridian or what do you actually do in your uh, in your care of an individual like this 
Well, I go through a bunch of um, psychological exercises with them and they get to rediscover themselves. They get to rediscover that they are very competent human beings and they finally see themselves in the light of self-confidence. Isn't that interesting? I mean, yes. I am telling you, you are going to absolutely love episode 011, Dr. Karen Jacobson, yeah. who does very similar things, but from a completely different perspective. And the whole, uh, her whole process is very similar, peeling the layers away, getting down to what's actually going on, and, and then having a transformational experience by actually undoing the issues that are present. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's about showing people that that I mean we identify what's bothering them and then we work on it um, strategies and you know of course we're um, accountability partners uh, because we see each other quite regularly so we're always talking about these things um, like even though I I am an acupuncturist uh, acupuncture is an adjunct it's uh, I use it in a different way from the way most acupuncturists do it. Um, I use it more for bolstering up uh, the areas of their psychological uh, being that needs bolstering up. For instance, for my son, um, I was needling areas that bolstered up his decision making and you need courage in order to make decisions, so I was bolstering up his courage. For this lady, it was about letting go of that sadness, of that regret that was in her life, and making her see that life was definitely worth living. <laughs> so are there acupuncture meridians? I mean, I'm an innocent here, I have to tell you. I mean, I'm interested in it, but and I, I don't know a thing about it, obviously, by the nature of the question, but are there meridians that actually can be uh, facilitated, moved around with acupuncture, that would actually uh, deal with grief or deal with um, uh, a person who's stuck in an arrested, uh, an arrested way on a, on a traumatic event? Well, there's such a thing as uh, esoteric acupuncture, which um, specifically uses certain points on those uh, meridians, because each one of those points on a meridian has a physical attribute, a mental emotional one, and a spiritual one. So depending on what the body and the mind needs, that's what, that, that is what is affected. And so there is definitely an art and a science to choosing these points. Um, so you break it out then for the person that they need one of these dimensions and work on that dimension and see where it goes. And they, so you do acupuncture. And you also work with them in terms of how they're living their life so they can reconceptualize ways out of that trap that they find themselves in. Absolutely. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, doctor. Well, it's, let me stop for just a second and mention, because we're getting near the end here, and I want to mention that we do have an interesting download giveaway here. Uh, Dr. Jo uh, Joni is going to give away her book. And uh, so the name of the book is... How to Heal Your Concussion, and she has the subtitle. Uh, Dr. Joni, could you give us the subtitle on the book? Okay, How to Quickly and Effectively Get Back in the Game. Wow. And so a person can read that book and have some other way to restructure their recovery activity from a concussion, traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are uh, absolute steps and uh, positive, proactive actions that you can take you don't have to do what somebody else tells you to do, which is do nothing. That is not a treatment. <laughs> there is actual steps that you can take in order to rewire your brain. That's really what it comes down to. Well, now, let me ask you this. As a traditional guy who is thinking about the larger picture and really trying to embrace a comprehensive solution, do these uh, suggestions you have, these these protocols that you have, do they stand in the way of any kind of a traditional uh, inquiry or attempt at uh, support, like uh, medications, for example? Well, um, oh, you mean if somebody is actually taking a medication? Well, yes. 
No, because it's all psychological wellness. It's all about rediscovering yourself and rediscovering your well-being. So the issue would be if they're taking medication, from your point of view, they would be covering something up. Oh, yeah, for sure. So then they, they have to kind of peel it down and get down to where they are and then start the process. It's, it's a pretty easy process to get into because it deals with things that everybody faces. You know, more, most people have at least one big worry in their life, you know, something that really stresses them out. So let's do something about it then instead of letting it stew. <laughs> so the, the uh, uh, what am I trying to say? The ridiculously simple uh, conclusion of what you're saying is that individuals with very traumatic, uh, even brain injury, physical symptoms, very frequently have underlying physical arrest points that aggravate the recovery process, that if they're not actually addressed, the recovery process really can't take place effectively. Hmm. Is, that, is that correct? Um, if I understand what you're saying, we... We have a physical problem, and the reason why we have a physical problem is because we need to deal with the psychological first. Okay. Okay? Yeah. So we're yeah. really saying the same thing. If you deal with this underlying psychological weakness, insufficiency, whatever you want to call it, then yeah. the overall physical healing can be actually embraced and, and uh, encouraged. Yes. Definitely, doctor. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. You know, we're, we're running out of time. I just love talking to you. You're such an interesting <laughs> person. And I could just see you struggling there with your son, uh, you know, and thinking about what am I going to do with this guy who's had these problems and how can I move him forward? And, you know, it's so hard in a family just dealing yeah. with a person that you love who thinks of you as a mother and, you know, coming from a, a medical family myself. You know, it's it's funny because people sometimes in your family uh, discredit the whole medical thing, even yeah. though you, you do it all day, every day. So I, I, that must have been a, a difficult, but it sounds like it was a terrific outcome. It sounds like it worked out for you. You know, I am so proud of my son because he trusted me that much. Um, he, he came to me with a ma big major problem, but I guess it's because... Um, you know, 10 years prior to that, it, he called me up. We were both at school. He was studying engineering, and I was studying Chinese medicine. He, he was very upset because a friend of his had just committed suicide. And, and he asked me, why, why? And I, and I thought about it, and I said to him, you know, it probably wasn't because his friend's father had been diagnosed with a brain tumor. And I said, it probably wasn't that that made him kill himself. He was probably very unhappy for many, many years and reasons, and that was the last straw. And then I told my son, look, you know, Nolan, you've, your mom and dad are always here for you, and come and talk to us when you have a problem, and don't ever, ever give up. And so I, re I remember that. So, so it was so important that I have this skill set that I'm able to help my son and help other people because I am so driven that I don't want any more suicides to happen because of the hopelessness of post-concussion syndrome. I don't want another person out there committing suicide. That is a very, very significant part of what happens with people who come back from the Gulf Wars, from TBI, and mm. and uh, and suicide is prevalent, and of course, self-medication is prevalent. We see it all the time. So, this book, your book, is how to heal your concussion, and we're going to have it as a download that people can. Ha we're going to have a drawing. You're not going to download it, but we're going to have a drawing for it. And the way to go into the drawing is zero one two corebrain dot uh, corebrainjournal dot com forward slash zero 12 download 012 download all in one row and when you submit your email there then we'll be able to draw from that and we'll actually shoot the book out to you once we have the drawing the drawing is going to take place in two weeks following this episode going live so you want to jump on it if and if you have somebody else that might be interested please forward the episode over to them so they can 
uh, jump on the possibility of downloading that uh, opportunity to get the book. So I want to also draw your attention to our show notes. Uh, Dr. Joni's given us some really good references. One of the things we try to do at Core Brain Journal is really make the presentations that we have uh, verifiable with peer-reviewed uh, scientific thought, and we have some, uh, Dr. Joni has some excellent uh, resources uh, for your reference here on the show notes if you just happen to be listening to this on the way to work. So in closing, uh, where can people get a hold of you, Dr. Joni, if they're thinking about further work? Could you give us uh, your contact information? Okay, and people can get hold of me at my website at www.drjoanny.com, drjoanny.com. And you can also find my books on Amazon. I've got three up there now. If you want, if you can't wait for the contest, um, yeah, mention those. Reach out to mention me those there. names, Doc. Mention those names, if you would, please. Okay, the books are called Knock Out Concussions, Knock Out Your Concussion, uh, Heal Your Concussion, 21 Days to Brain Health, and Heal Your Concussion, How to Quickly and Effectively Get Back in the Game. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us here. It's really, it's a different perspective for a lot of people. It's one of the reasons we're doing this, because there are other ways to skin the cat and to just think of the hopelessness of people that don't have a way out and looking at options for different ways to start to really rebuild your life following traumatic injury. It's, it's a very important discussion to have, and thank you very much for, for being with us today. Thank you for allowing me to be part of your mission. I'm so proud and happy. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Joni. We, we will see you soon. We'll talk again. Okay. Have a great awesome. day. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications like those written for ADHD are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.